So today, the topic for today is about what the difference is between stretching with and without contact. And the reason why I brought this topic up is because I've seen a lot of posts lately in the group with people thinking that the only thing arthritis is about is just letting them drop on the forehead, letting them stretch down without any contact. And I feel that if that's what people are thinking, they're really not understanding the concept of arthritis. So I think it's good to spend some time talking about what the difference is between stretching with and without the contact. So when I have this question, Will, what is, what is the first thing that comes to your mind that you want to share about this? Well, the first thing we need to talk about is they're stretching and then they're stretching and having the horse actually moving through its back. Why it's stretching? So the first thing to understand is you certainly can get a horse um, to stretch its neck down without engaging through its back. So this is the first thing for people to recognize. That is why when you see me starting horses in work in hand, the stretch comes as a result of what I'm doing with the back end of the horse, getting the horse to engage its inside high and leg, usually on a circle, getting it to push up its back. And then it's get its head pushed down. You know, it pushes itself, it pushes its own neck down out as it begins to activate and lift its back a little bit. It's the natural result of the horse moving correctly through its back. But understand that that's, you know, once again, you can get a horse, you can stand there with a piece of treat or whatever, and the horse can stretch there with no impulsion whatsoever and stretch to the ground its neck down. But that doesn't mean it's going through its back. And that's what leads to some of the confusion with people because they see there's a whole Western school of riding where they do this sort of what they call over here, they call it peanut rolling where the horse's nose are on the ground, but they're never with any impulsion. So they usually actually teach them to stretch with using st neck stretchers and all kinds of devices to force the head and neck down, which of course we never do. When I work a horse, its neck goes down because I have gotten its back to come up and that is what pushes the neck forward and lifts the back and down. So understanding that to start with. So once again, you can get a horse to stretch its neck down. That doesn't mean it's moving through its back. So that's only the first sort of, uh, that has to be happening. But as I said, the way we go about it, you know, in our to ride is I teach you to activate the back and the stretch comes as an activation of the back. So when you get the stretch, the back is coming up into the correct position if you have done it correctly. So that's the first thing to understand. A, a number one, the horse can stretch its neck without engaging through its back. Let's get to that again. And then what you wanna do from there. So then of course, then it's whether or not the horse is in the stretch, whether it's moving through its back or not. You know, and you can recognize, and this is a bit of confusing thing for people to understand. When you start with horses that have no top line at all, especially these horses that are already sway back or have kissing spine or some of these kinds of things, these kinds of horses, when we get them to release the neck and stretch down, they have no top line. So the stretch will go all the way to the ground, and that's what you want to let them do because it's only when the horse begins to develop top line that the back begins, you know, the back stays up and the neck begins to lift up and out the way it should be as the horse develops. The horse develops, we never have to pull a horse's head up from the stretch. As the horse develops over time, and this takes about a year and a half to two years to, with any horse, whether you're starting with a young green horse or you're starting with an older horse, it's about the same amount of time to get them consistently over their back. It's about a one and a half to two year process. And if you read any books by anybody of the past who knew what they were talking about, for instance, the Spanish Riding School's book of uh, complete horse and the complete training of the horse and rider. And I always say when I point out that book, I always remember to tell people that the book that you'll find, you know, on the shelf was was as authored by Alois Podaisky. Alois Podaisky did not write the book. He stole the book from the Spanish Riding School, <laughs> which he was there. I mean, the, and, I, and I say this, I went there, I spent two weeks at the Spanish Riding School in about 1972 or three or four or something like that. And, uh, you know, this was told me because when I went there, because everybody in America and Europe, they all know the name Alois Podaisky because he was the military administrator who had been put in charge of the Spanish Riding School. And he was involved in saving the white horses when Patton saved them from being eaten as all horses, most horses were in Europe during that particular time at the end of World War II and during World War II. So anyway, so I just always point that out to people because it's very, the history of dressage is one of the things that I've spent years like, you know, beating my way through to understand what was real and what wasn't and what was things that people just sort of 
became legendary, but the people were, you know, were not necessarily doing what we would particularly like them to do as we think about it. So, you know, learning the real history of dressage is an interesting thing. But once again, if you look at any of these books that from people who the Spanish Writing Schools book, or you look at Klaus Bachenhall, or you look at um, um, Egon von Neindorf, anybody in, in the past who developed horses from young horses, they all talk about it taking a couple of years to put the basics on a horse. And that's what, that's what it takes. What led away from that to a great deal was um, the breed disciplines. You know, we have all these breed disciplines. The breeders want to sell horses. So they want to sell them as young as possible so they can get rid of them. And it doesn't cost them another year to keep them. So that's what led to all these horrible young horse uh, tests for different breeds where they're bringing these horses in at two and three and making them go through you know, this very rigorous testing uh, I say at a way too young age, horses do not mature till they're eight years old. So to be, to be forcing horses into these phony frames at three and four years old is what wrecks most horses, you know, because they're too young to be doing it. It destroys their, you know, the skeletal uh, structure of the horse because they're, it's too much too soon. So anyway, getting back to the subject at hand here um, in this two year process, that's going to take you. So getting back to the stretching, when we first have a horse that has no top line, it's going to stretch all the way to the ground. And that's where you want to leave it as long as you can get it swinging through its back. And what you will see over time is the neck will go from this straight down position to slowly rising itself up as the withers come up through the shoulders and the horse develops correctly. So all of that, I'm making the point here can happen without any contact at all. So, I mean, if you take, uh, a young horse, and I've trained thousands of them from the beginning at this point in my life. Most young horses, just I start horses with just what I call lunging halter on with no bit in their mouth or anything like this. Most young horses within a few minutes of either work in hand or lunging will start to stretch, you know, unless they're super overly excited at this kind of thing, you know. So once again, so we can get all that to happen. In fact, we have to get all that to happen in the very beginning when we start horses because they don't know anything about bit contact. So this brings up another subject that you have to understand, which is about contact. So contact is not something that you say, okay, take contact and you can take contact. It's not that simple. So to start <laughs> with, the horse has to, be, has, to, has to be comfortable with a bit in its mouth. So before we can do anything else with the bit in terms of trying to school the horse in any way, the horse simply has to be, have had a bit in its mouth long enough that it's not overreacting to it. In other words, that it's gotten used to the idea of carrying a bit, its mouth has become quiet and, and you see a little foam forming at the lip. So all that should happen just on a lunge line in just a halter or a lunging cavison if you have one that actually fit, fits your horse's head. Most of them don't. I don't, I, I point this out to people. A lot of people think it's not, it's only classical to lunge with these with lunging cavisons. But the reality is most of them do not fit horses. I mean, you really have to have one fitted to the horse. Most of them pull around and end up going into the horse's eye on one side. They're way too tight around the nose. You have, I mean, we talk about, you know, what you have to understand, and it's the same thing with Western, you know, with these Bozal bridles and the kinds the Indian used to use, you know, with the rope around them, the kind of around the nose. All of these things work because the soft tissue of the lower part of a horse's nose is nothing but cartilage. So once again, with those lunging cavisons, with all that metal in them, you can really tear up the bones in a horse's face, you know, by yanking on those things. So I just point this out because there are some people who will say, oh, if you're not lunging in a cavo, it's not classical not to use one of these. But <laughs> again, you know, what's classical has nothing to do with that. It's not, it's what's not what is classical is not creating pain in your horse and creating problems that you're going to have later on like when you've torn the horse's cartilage up because you've yanked on that that lunging cavison so much or it's come around and gotten into the horse's eye which is what happens with most of them so anyway i'm just pointing all these little points out but <laughs> once we get them to stretch on the lunge line as i said horses will generally um, I farly and fired any of the young horses that I've ever started in my life. It doesn't take long before they naturally, if someone has stopped horses from moving correctly. And that's the biggest problem here is that we have people starting horses very young. They start them hollow because they don't understand the principle. And the horse starts learning to move that way. Or they're horses that have never gotten enough work to start with, or they've been raised in a small pen where people have turned their horses into what I call like couch potatoes, like young children who've never done anything. They've lived, they're living in a, you know, a hundred foot pen or even less than that. 
they're growing up. And if you do, they're not getting the right kind of movement, their backs start to sink and they're hollow at three years old because they're not getting enough movement. Horses need to be raised on huge pastures. And I'm not talking about like a little one acre paddock thing you have. I mean, horses should be raised on hundreds of acres and move around on fields with, with, uh, with safe footing so they're safe and they develop correctly. So getting back to the point here I'm making is that once we start a young horse, we just let them carry the bit in their mouth. We cannot touch the bit until the, ho until the horse is totally comfortable with it just being in his mouth. And then the next step, of course, now, the problem is, why do we want to stretch them into contact? Well, we want to ride them eventually, right? So as I said, we can get horses to stretch. You know, They don't need to have a bit on to stretch, but to be ridden and ridden in a way that we can really control the frame. Now, can you ride a horse without a bit? Of course, you can ride a horse without a bit. But what I will say about that is that, you know, you'll never get the kind of sensitivity and the quick response that you would like to have from a horse. I mean, the bit allows you to communicate very softly and very gently with the horse, you know, in a way that is not oppressive to the horse and that that opens the channels of communication. If you're riding a horse on a halter, well, you just don't have that close contact. I mean, you know, you can ride them in kind of reins on a halter or whatever on your bridleless bit or whatever the case may be, but you're working off, once again, all bridleless bits work off the face of the horse. They work in some way by putting pressure on the lower part of the soft cartilage of the lower part of the horse's face. Um, and so, yes, they will do that, but you're never going to be able to get really quick responses out of a horse that way. I'm sure there are people who will argue with me about this, but I'm talking about a kind of communication where you are totally one with the horse and you can feel every movement and you can sp respond to the slightest movement the horse makes, you know, and uh, in, in order to do that, I believe you have to be, you have to have contact with the bridle because that's what enables you to really control the elasticity of the back when the contact is correct. So once again, what I'm saying here to back up is they can stretch without contact, but if we want to ride them and ride them well and be able to control them, then we need to teach them about a bit. We have to have some way of communicating. And if we want to uh, ride in a way that has a lot of finesse to it, if you will, and this sort of thing, you know, we want, the contact with the bit allows that to happen and does not cause the horse any pain at all. But once again, remember that this contact with the bit is dependent on the horse accepting the bit in its mouth. And that includes being able to relax the jaw and pull. No horse ever can relax correctly and take correct contact until the back has lifted. That's what allows the pole up here and the jaw here to relax. Until a horse has lifted its back, it's all part of the same thing. The spine runs from the tip of the tail, the dock of the tail, all the way, you know, to the top of the pole where the, where the spine connects. And once again, that connection is dependent on the connection. Can I, that we like, can I ask you a question about yeah. that? Because one of the yeah. things that people continuously ask me is mm -hmm. like, okay, but then the horse is going down with the, with the head and what does that mean and i try to keep on explaining like that is a result from that back being activated and then when they're struggling with the contact i try to keep explaining that the stronger the horse becomes and the more consistent it's going to become through the back the more consistent the contact is also going to be so when there's no contact it doesn't mean that you just leave it that way. Once the horse starts to reach towards the bit and maybe you lose contact on and off there, your goal should still be to keep searching for the contact with the horse's mouth there. It's a process that takes time for your horse to, to get there and to relax there and to become stronger there. And especially the last one, you don't build strength in a week time. If I go to the gym now, I don't do a hundred sit-ups sit tomorrow. It takes time for me to, to gain okay. that strength, you know, and the, the same goes with your horse. Am I off there or do you think along in the same line? No, absolutely. And that's the point is to understand and the head and neck position. What we have to understand is that every horse, depending on its level of strength, when you bring the head to a certain point, the back will drop. So in order for the horse, and once again, in real collection, this idea of having horses' heads way up in the air 
is just a silly notion that has more to do with saddlebreds and Tennessee walkers than it has to do with anything else. Real <laughs> collection and the position of the head and neck comes from lowering the hindquarters. That's what the horse begin, every horse will begin to appear much taller when it begins to actually collect and can lower the three joints of the hind leg. So once again, yes, and this process can take, you know, anywhere up to, you know, it always takes at least a year with young horses to, to reach this phase of the development you know, and it, it's usually more like a year. And if the horse is still growing, no horse is ever going to stabilize in the frame until its growth process is finished. Horses finish growing at eight years old. They're not anywhere near grown at four years old. Some of them, if they are, if they have been, if they've been raised correctly and their backs have developed correctly. So you're not starting at, ze at below zero. In other words, you have a young horse that's healthy and has developed in a healthy way. Then it doesn't, you know, it's, it's a pretty quick process. But what most people have to realize is today, most horses aren't raised that way. Most horses today are couch potatoes. They get raised in too small an areas and they don't develop correctly. Or, they, or, or like out here where I live in California, nobody has grass. So people say they have pastures, but what they have is a dirt lot. The horse, so the horses don't, they don't wander around eating off the grass. The, head, the hay is all fed at one corner of the dirt lot. And that's where the horses stand all day, waiting for the hay to come back to that part of the dirt lot. So don't call it a pasture. If there's no grass in there, don't call what you're in a pasture or think that it's going to help your horse develop. And many people, I'm, I talk, I'm in the West. So, you know, these people who live in deserty areas need to realize this, you know, you, uh, the desert is not a great place for a horse. You know, it's not the kind of footing that horses like. They like grassy, you know, moist footing, this kind of thing. You know, they, they weren't desert animals, though. I obviously some have adapted better. Uh, to that, like Arabs and things like that, who've been raised there for thousands of years in that kind of those kinds of climates. But we have to always understand the horse that we have, the level of health when we start and how long it's going to take. Now, that's the importance of lunging and side reins, because once the horse, you know, you say, well, the horse is pulling. Well, if the horse is pulling out of your hands. You haven't done, you know, you haven't, the horse has not been educated from the ground first, because the point is, when I start to ride a horse, I'm not going to get on. I, you know, I may get on it and get off a few times. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not. I never expect to do a lot of riding until the horse is over its back, because otherwise you're wasting your time. If you get on the horse and its back collapses, there's no point in riding it because you have to make it strong enough that it can carry your weight. And this is a a big thing for people to realize that you know even the biggest horses, in fact, as as you've discovered. The biggest horses actually have the weakest back. Frisians are the weakest back horses of any breed that I know of. Almost every one of them you see is sway back because some overweight person buys them thinking that they're big enough to carry them. And these, I mean, you know, if you are a heavy person, you are much better off on a 15 three hand quarter horse with a short back, you know, and little short stubby legs that can actually carry you. Some 17, 18 hand horse with a super long back like a Frisian is not the choice for a heavy I, person. I, honestly, I really underestimated, first of all, the sensitivity of a Frisian because yeah. dear Lord, Arabians are easier to handle. And I'm not joking, she is a handful. And secondly, her back is really weak. And she is a small one because Frisians are bred really, really tall right now. But she's a small, okay. compact Frisian. And well, her back, she like she looks a lot because she lifts her head quite easily because that's how she's built. But it's not correct work. I can feel the difference when she's actually pushing up her back. And that's absolutely not when she's in a working frame. She's just not capable to do that. And she probably will not be for the next year. And then it, I would it, imagine it not. Insane. You know, once again, she's only your horse is only what four or five. How old is that horse four, now? Four. She's going to grow yeah. until eight. So, so um, she's got four more years of growing time. So, I mean, the luckily thing is she seems to be. But also, don't be surprised for people that are dealing with young horses. Is that young horses, if they have not, if they're not fully grown, and we've gone through this with Q. Some of you who are watching Q. Q has changed dramatically. She's gone like this and like this and like this and like this. And she's finally only now. We, just the other day, I looked at her and all of a sudden, I had this great day wondering if the play was really balanced. And you look at all of a sudden, there's a withers there. Everything has suddenly changed. And we have to just, the, the real trick to training horses is having the patient, it's not what we do when we on them. It's sitting back and looking at them every day. How are they developing? Are we seeing the right things happen? You know, it's like creating a sculpture very slowly that we have to, you know, it has to grow into the position that we want. But, and that's really the art of it. I mean, anybody can just, you know, slap some 
hard side reins on a horse, which is what we see all the time, you know, shorten their necks up and shorten their strides and then and they think they're training. But if the result is, I mean, we have a total epidemic of kissing spine in the world today, all these horses, it's amazing. And this is why, you know, A, doubled with the fact that these young horses aren't getting raised correctly. They're not getting raised with enough area that they move and develop correctly as young horses. Then they're being brought in at three or four years old, and now they're in stalls all the time, standing there upside down, and then being ridden upside down. So this is how they all end up the way we end up. So, and, and then let's let's not forget about the practices where horses are still being tied up with their noses towards their sides for yeah, hours yeah. because they're not bending properly. Because this is still right. stuff that's happening nowadays. And I'm like, how yeah. barbaric is this? But yeah. It's, and so the first thing people understand is that no horse can bend until it can lift its back. That's what, so when you see people pulling horses immediately, when you see people bending horses necks from side to side, they say they're suppling, you know immediately that this person knows absolutely nothing because bending a horse's neck from side to side does absolutely nothing but shorten the stride, you know, and shorten the neck back into the body. It does nothing else, you know, but that's, you know, being sure that we understand the difference between collection and shortening a horse's stride. Most people today think they're collecting their horses. They are not at all. All the horse is doing is shortening its stride. Remembering once again, that collection is not something different from a working trot. It's a higher level of development of a working trot. It's the, it's the degree to which the horse lifts the body of the horse off the ground. As the horse develops more collection, it begins to lower the joints of the hind leg and it lifts the body higher off the ground. That's what collection is. it is not shortening horse into little mincing strides like this. And I mean, we hear I hear trainers all the time saying, collect them up now, collect them up, yeah, collect them, shorten them, shorten them. Shortening has nothing to do with collection. We want to go from a big stride over the back, and then as that collects, it lifts up. So the stride no longer is as big as it was, but only because what we're losing in length of stride, we're gaining in lift and roundness of the stride, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So getting back to this contact issue, that's why it's so important. People say, oh, my horse is pulling down on me. Well, if he's pulling down on you, you haven't done the groundwork correctly. In other words, the horse should be lunged with side reins correctly until the horse correctly takes contact with them and will stay there. And that's what the side reins are, is they simply limit the length of the horses of the reins so the horse can't pull the reins. It learns to not pull the reins out of the hands because you limit the length of those reins. But we yeah, never- I, I, I'm going to make a short uh, sidestep yep. on that because I, had, I yep. actually had someone asking a question about that that is okay. Jean, I think. And she asked, like, how can I feel the difference between the horse taking contact with the bit as opposed to leaning onto the bit? So I, I think with that question, she means like when the horse is getting really heavy and pushy on the bit. I think for that, it means that the horse actually is not ready to be in that in that position yet. And the, the difference is that if you if you if the horse is just moving into the contact, the contact is literally the weight of the rein. It's nothing. You just feel a very slight push slash lean of the horse taking your hand and that's it if the horse is starting pushing and you feel that you need to use strength to keep your hands closed and your hands in the right position it means that the position is actually too high for the horse and you should just let it down and as long as you open your hand there and the horse is stretching down following your hand there you should know enough there gene to 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 know that 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 position was a little bit too much for your horse right well am i am i wrong there no, exactly. That's the whole point. So when the horse will start to resist when it's uncomfortable. But once again, I'm just pointing out this idea that, you know, the horse must, this work must start from the ground first. So when you see the horse that on a lunge line will stretch into the contact yet without pulling on it or, you know, doing all this stuff and you see just a nice quiet, the horse gets in the zone. Well, that's a horse that's ready to start riding and taking contact. Because before that, I mean, you know, Yes, if you're really a fabulous, fabulous rider, you know, maybe you can do some of this from up there without going through these processes. But I will say I've watched the best riders in the world, like Daniel Oliveira, and he never got on a horse without lunging at first and getting it totally relaxed. I mean, ever. I never saw him get on any horse without ever doing the groundwork first with it. And uh, now, of course, when we were there, the student horses, they were not lunged or anything. They were 30 years old, some of them. But but the point is, all the horses that he actually worked in training and rode and trained, 
He lunged them every day before he got on. I never saw him ever get on a horse. Now, I don't agree with that entirely either. I think at some point you can start riding without lunging. But I had pointed out that someone as, as well known and famous as he was, I mean, he never got on a horse without lunging at first and warming it up from the ground first ever. I never, I saw him over a five year period of my life and I never saw him ever work a horse without lunging at first. Also, not his, his very, very far educated horses also, he also lunged them first. Absolutely. All of them. Now, I never saw him get on a horse ever. Now, he may have at other times younger in his life. Now, he had a lot of young horses when I was working with him, but he always lunged them first before. he. In fact, he said, I heard him say many times that dressage training was done. 80% of dressage training is done on the lunge line. I mean, I heard him say that many, many times because when that is it, I always tell people, you know, when the horse looks like something you want to ride on the lunge line that's when you start riding if the horse still looks like an idiot on the lunge line and can't balance itself <laughs> why do you think it's going to be better when you get up there it's not going to be yeah. it's not, it's, it's going to be what what whatever you see with the horse on its own carrying itself it's never going to be better just because you get on its back if you have done the groundwork correctly i'm saying that's not to say that you know once in a while some great rider maybe can get on a, you know we see riders get on but what i see you know when i see and, the, and it's kind of the reason that you know, I don't really ride people's horses for them anymore in lessons, in very few cases anymore, because, you know, they, I've seen too much of that. Yes, I can get on and do much more than you can, but, you know, if the horse has been prepared along the way as trainers, is what we talk about, and part of this we should talk about, which is this issue of, you know, students have to learn correct contact, just like the horses have to learn correct contact. So, unfortunately, we live in a world where very few of you have you know, made horses that were trained correctly. Most of you are trying to reschool a horse or starting with a young one or whatever the case may be. And you've never done this either. So, you know, for the two of you, you have to understand that there's going to be a learning, just like I can, I can sit you down at the piano and tell you, well, you have to move your fingers. You know, well, the <laughs> problem is, you know, it's going to take you years to learn your finger to move them well enough to actually play something. Well, the same is true of riding a horse. You know, it's a technique. It's a physical technique that you have to learn you know, to train your body, you know, not to over tense, not to tense yourself too much, because that has to do with your contact as well. If you're a tense person, you're going to have tense contact. It's very simple. So, you know, getting yourself, being patient with yourself. And that's also why the work in hand is so important. I mean, you can get on the back of the horse, as we see trainers do all the time, grab hold of their mouths and start whipping them up and try to, you know, force them up into some kind of frame. Now, the problem is when trainers do that, yes, some of them can get a horse's back up doing that, but they get it back up in tension. So a back up in tension is no better than having a hollow horse because the tension destroys the horse's ability to absorb the shock into the soft tissue because now the soft tissue is all hard because the horse is tense. You know, So once again, just understanding that first we have to get the horse. It has to be accepting the contact from the ground first with a nice quiet mouth. It's not you know, doing all this crazy stuff. Then you have a good chance of being able to succeed. For all of you learning this, the work in hand is so important because you can't just from the ground, if you just grab hold of the mouth like you can up on the top of the horse, the horse is not going to go anywhere. It's just going to stop in the place. And that's really what's happening when they're up on them. So the work in hand really teaches you to be subtle and to keep a soft, relaxed, and pliable contact that is not so rigid that it's stopping the movement of the horse. Half the horses I see today going, they look like the brakes are on all the time. The horses look like, like a car that's got the emergency brake stuck. It's kind of lurching. The rhythm never gets right or never gets. And if you watch any of the last Olympic games, I, I, I just... I had to turn it off after about 10 horses because it just dis was disturbing me. I mean, don't say too much about that because I have a topic coming up in, in four weeks from now that's exactly about this. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm going to shut you down there. Listen, okay. Bill, we only have about six minutes left. I want to okay. do one short side step towards okay. the Western riding and then yep. we might want to take some time to answer some questions. Okay. So the thing is with Western riding, I'm an old rainer, so that's why yeah. I'm, I'm feeling a little bit sometimes the people are saying that in the Western, you need to ride the horses be like off the rein. And I disagree with that because long as long as you're training young horses and you want them correctly over their backs, you have to snaffle a bit and you work them with the snaffle bit towards the contact. As soon as you're ready, because at certain levels, you need to start showing with shank bits. That's the moment when you're talking about slack in the rein. But the thing is that these bits are bits with leverage which means that for you as a rider you feel less in your hand but the context for the horse doesn't really change so first you want the horse to move towards the bit and work them into the contact and develop them over their backs and when they're able to move the weight 
on four legs, especially with quarter horses and peds, because they're moved on their, they're built on their front legs. So you really need to develop them over their backs to get them like really shift the weight to the hind legs. As soon as they're capable to work into the bit, into the contact and over their backs, then you can start shifting to things like um, a snaffle, a shank snaffles and stuff that's like a light shank bit. You're allowed to show with them in all classes, so it makes no sense to switch to correctionals and that kind of stuff. It's all too heavy. But if you use the weight of the rein, it's still working into the contact and the horse can stay over its back. The slack in the rain and the snaffle bit does absolutely nothing but making your horse head set. Am I am I missing here something, Will? No, I think yeah, you know, I think I think it is, you know, it's certainly possible even in a snaffle rain, you know, when the horse is going correctly to just let it go slack as long as you can feel that the back is everything is moving in the same place. There's nothing right. you can do that. But but once again, it's that thing of being aware of. You know, the most important thing that I and what uh, my whole thing here with all of you is trying to teach you all the time and showing you the difference between horses that are working over their backs and ones that are not. So the most important thing is you getting an eye for being able to look at any horses and being able to recognize correct uh, muscular development. So I would say, I don't need to see a horse go. I can walk down any barn aisle in, in the world and tell you exactly how every horse is going to go by looking at their muscling and tell you how they're muscling. The muscling tells yeah. the whole story. If they have no top line in their hollow, well, they're not going to move any differently than that when you get them out. They're going to be whatever they are. And that is all told by the muscling that you see on the horse. So, yeah, so the slack of the rain is not always like, you need to look at the horse and you need to feel how your horse is going. We only yeah. have Three and a half minutes left. Michelle, I see your question. How do you get one to stretch into a bit that wants to stay behind the bit? I'm going to answer that question to you in person um, because that goes all the way to the work in hand. So I'm going to help you out with that. Another question is, when would you go to the next step in the training in case of launching from a normal halter to the side reins? So when would you when would you do the normal launching and when are you going to start adding side reins to your training? Like what would be a nice cue to have? The horse's mouth is quiet. So the horse is telling you. So when the horse's mouth is quiet, it's carrying a bit in its mouth without opening and closing its mouth, without blah, 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 doing all this kind of stuff, Has develops a nice little foam across the lips with doing nothing with the bit. That's when the horse is ready to start uh, learning contact because the mouth has been prepared now to learn contact. In other words, it's not... It's, it's become comfortable with a bit in its mouth. So once again, my point is we can't start to do anything with the bit until the horse will just carry the bit comfortably. As soon as you see that, then you can start adding side reins to teach the horse to stretch into those kind reins. And then at once we get the horse to stretch into the kind reins, it's a, as, and you can try at any time. Once again, don't be afraid to try things if they don't work. Once again, try bringing your horse's head up. If the back collapses, put the head back down. I mean, it's as simple as that. The back guides everything we do and the horse moving through its back. So the same thing on the lunge line. If the horse isn't moving through its back and you, and you can recognize that, then you can think about what you need to do about it, which is usually to get the hindquarters more to the outside, get them pushing them up off through the inside hind leg. But once again, that's that, once again, just the horse has to accept the contact in the bit with the bit, then it's ready to start putting side reins on. And it's a very natural process of the side reins. We never shorten the horse. I've tried to show you guys, the, where we went wrong in the Western world is people, I mean, uh, people started taking side reins. Side reins were intended to just be long. If you shorten them when they're on the side, they roll the horse over. So that's why we put the side reins up on top. If the horse has learned to stretch into the contact and you put the side reins up along from the D rings up on the side of the pommel, the horse, if it has, it's ready to be ridden this way, will stretch correctly into the contact, just like it will be with your hands. Newton Oliveri used to say the best hands in the world work just like a pair of side reins. They simply limit the length of the rein. Most people, that's, however, a very hard thing to do. So in other words, if you're, if you're working this horse that, and some of you have seen me with some of these lessons with the young people that I are young riders and horses or um, inexperienced riders I'm talking about, I will have them start with side reins on. So they're, with, so they're like training wheels. So the horse can get, the rider has to worry about what their legs are doing first. The horse will then stretch into the contact. But if your hands were quiet enough to be there with contact and not pull back and forth and not be doing other things, the horse would stretch into it just like they would if the side reins are up on top. Yeah. I only have one minute left, so I'm I'm what? going to cut this down now. Oh yeah, wait. Um, is, there, is there? I'm just saying. Is there a reason why we need to stop? I mean, if people yeah, are still. Yeah, because I I'm using now the 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 free version of Zoom, and I only had forty minutes, so oh, I. Okay. So, so that's why I, I need to cut it down now, okay. or we need okay. to reopen the whole yeah. session again. Okay.
We can well, reconnect. We can definitely try to reconnect. Do we need to reopen in a few minutes? You can use the same link and you guys can all join in. We can go on a little mm -hmm. bit longer. <laughs> yes, reconnect. Okay. Everyone, okay. everyone is well, asking to reconnect. So we're going we're to reconnect. reconnect. Okay, so we do that. Should we stop now and just reconnect us? And I'm going to send a new one and okay. you all can join okay. in. So we'll send a new thing. We'll pop back up and we'll keep going as long as people have questions here, or at least for a while anyway. <laughs> for sure, definitely. All See right. you in a minute. We'll be back. We'll be back very shortly. Okay. So, well, since we have some more time, I want to go back to the question that uh, Michelle asked before. And her question was, uh, like, if you have a horse that consistently wants to stay behind the bit, do you have any particular tips that would help to get that horse more into the contact? Okay, a horse that's coming behind the bit is a horse that's not really letting enough energy come through its back as that that will just um if any of you saw the little clip i put of uh, uh terran's horse a couple of days ago that was the first day after about six months that the horse actually started to push its nose out and forward and lengthen the neck entirely so just know that that is something that if you keep doing the right things if you keep getting the horse to swinging through its back correctly that will disappear on its own as the horse develops and the neck begins to come out and the uh, once again the withers has to come up first and that once again <clears throat> takes a year to a year and a half or so depending on the horse and uh, once again how they were developed as young horses and where they're at in that so that's basically it it's going to take a little bit of time don't just keep doing what you're doing and it should so if you're if you're getting the horse through the back and you're recognizing that point when you're getting enough energy you know, and once again, that comes down to when you can <clears throat> see the diagonal pairs in the trot really swinging in absolute unison together, you know, um, that's part of the thing. You know, when you see the hawks moving in a nice round circle consistently, you know, these are the things that we begin to recognize with our eyes. So if you are, and that's why that's the most important thing. The most important thing for you all to learn is to recognize horses that are moving through their backs and when they are not. So once you learn that, if you keep getting the horse moving through its back, those problems, in fact, all the problems will disappear. The horses that have been overflexed in the neck, which almost all horses that come behind the bridle, and understand that almost all horses today are overflexed in the third or fourth vertebrae in the neck because people are riding them hollow. If you try to put a horse on the bit, as they say, and the horse is not through its back, it will never relax the jaw. It cannot. It can relax the pull. It cannot relax the pull. So that's why they overflex back in the neck, because it's very easy to, <clears throat> to force those tendons to pull apart. There's a weak point in every horse in their neck in about the third or fourth vertebra position. So it's very easy with a pair of side reins or draw reins to pull the horse over and overflex that. And when you see that, what that is, is the tendons have actually been pulled apart. So you actually have a separation of the vertebra happening. So what you have to understand, if any of you have ever, ever pulled a ligament as opposed to breaking a bone, it takes longer to heal a ligament than it does to break a bone for a bone to heal. So it always takes, that's why I tell people when I go to look at horses, the first thing I look at is whether they're overflexed in the neck, because I know it is going to take at least a year to two years for that to heal and the neck to be able to straighten and the horse to go into the correct position. That's what so, she had, right? She was already right, exactly. So she had been really good. severely overflexed in the neck. Um, we still liked her enough to buy her, but once again, that is the first. It was the one thing we questioned. We almost didn't buy her because of that, you know. Uh, but she's been an interesting case. She's a very long back horse. It's you know we've been working for a couple of years now with her. She is just now starting to bring the neck up into position. And she's done, all of a sudden, I said, only in the last two weeks, all of a sudden there's a withers coming up through there. But once again, she's only, you know, she's now six, but she's got another two years of growing. She's only just coming, starting to look like a mature horse and the top line developed correctly. So I hope I answered that question. <laughs> yeah, so we have another one from, let me check from Lisa, because she says, just so I understand the steps with the young horse or rehab, are one, to start on the lunge with a halter, and then two, introduce the bit, and then yep. three, when comfortable, start uh, with the bit, then start with the side reins and stuff. What I'm missing out in this phase is a little bit uh, when you start with a working hand, because that would suggest that you start with a working hand after you've int introduced the bit on the lunge. Well, and certainly you're not going to be able to work in hand the way we want to work in hand, you know, with a bit and teaching until the horse has come. So once again, this idea 
the horse has to be comfortable in the mouth before you ever touch the bit. So that has to happen. So now how it doesn't mean there's different levels of work in hand. You can work a horse a hand in hand in a halter. I mean, just by you know, moving them around, doing some basic, you know, asking them to move off your legs so they move a little bit sideways. So you can start all of that in just a halter, but know that we have to get a bit in the mouth before we're really going to be able to get full control over the frame of the horse. But once again, the frame of the horse has to develop enough top line that there's something that we can control, that we can bring up and down, you know? So that's the hard, you know, we have to think about, you know, most accidents that I've ever seen in my life, and I've seen hundreds of them, were caused by people getting on young horses or thinking that young horses were able to do something that they were not. Like, or in other words, making the mistake of thinking, oh, I've been on this horse for two weeks, it's nice and calm in the ring, I'll take it out for a trail ride, or let's take it out with five other horses. You know, people making this mistake of thinking, oh, I've got a nice calm, let's go see what happens. It doesn't work that way. As soon as you get young horses out the door, you know, if they've never been outside, now you're in company and something excites them or, you know, a wild turkey comes out of the bushes or a dog or whatever the case may be. And you simply you quickly find out that the horse really isn't as trained as you thought it was. And all of a sudden it gets excited and, you know, and you're on the ground and away you go. So, I mean, I, I want a horse very rideable, you know, and over their back and accepting contact with the bridle before I ever do much with them other than ride them in the ring. I mean, I'm never going to take a horse out that isn't over its back that I can't at least on some level control the frame. And I've gotten, you know, a, a level of trust between the horse and I so that, you know, because I always know when I go out that something is going to go wrong. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, there's somebody's <laughs> going to come by. I mean, I, you know, I, I grew up in Kentucky where, you know, people threw beer bottles at you out the window of their cars if they saw you on the back of a horse. It was very, a uh, very strange place in that kind of sense. So <laughs> well, you never knew what people were, you know, I've been out many times and had people, you know, there's idiots that will try to spook people on horses, you know, things like that, that we run into over here in America. I don't know, maybe not so much over there where you are, but things are more are closer, but you know, that's, that was kind of a thing growing up here of that. And, and once again, you did not want to be on some young horse that knew nothing out there doing and, and encountering these things. So I want a horse to be pretty much in working gates before I start taking them anywhere or doing anything more than riding them in an arena. Then I know that I, I have enough control that if something goes wrong, they may get excited, but I'm probably going to be able to work them through it and bring them back to some kind of understanding. Yeah, yeah that's what I had with my young Frisian because I've been having her really under saddle for the last two months. And then yeah. I did a demo with her two weeks ago and I needed to introduce her to a wide ringed arena in the mm -hmm. normal riding area. So that's mm -hmm. already like, what, uh, what happened here? And then uh, there was uh, audience. And then uh, like seven days later, I did a freestyle on music and there was loud music. She was a saint. Like uh, I was so happy. Like she was a little bit more tense than usual, uh, but I was allowed to work her the same way I always do working her into the stretch and just having my normal routine with her. And that was really nice. It was a really good experience to gain confidence. And actually we started cantering last week because we got enough confidence that I trusted her not to run off with me while cantering. Yeah. So now we can canter. So that was a really good well, experience. Good. I thought you did a great job. And once again, your preparation, you know, if, if your preparation had not been good, you would have had a very different oh, no. experience. You no, know I mean? no, no, no. How many people I've seen, you know, try to take horses to horse shows on their, you know, the first time, you know, they've never been anywhere. And all of a sudden they're going to try to go take them to a horse show. And they've never done anything in their lives and, and, and aren't on the bit or not praying. And they, you know, wonder why Just one big ball we have so dress. many accidents. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, let's okay. continue with the question. Uh -huh. yeah. Lisa, well, to, to answer your question, I think it was quite clear that your, your order of like getting them on the lunch and then introducing the bit and then when they're comfortable, you can start with side reins. The yeah. next question that she had is in addition to that is like with the side reins, do you start at girth level and then do you move them up um, uh, as they strengthen? Well, yeah. Uh, I actually have my side reins always on the top ring, but then with I lengthen them with... Um, with the, the the straps from stirrup from no from uh, from your spurs to to have them long enough so the position of the hand is sort of similar but then the length just helps them move into the contact. Yeah, and um, that's the next step. I prefer it depends on the horses because when when we're starting out with lunge, um, if we put them up on the high, I mean you've done enough work that obviously it worked for you with your horse and you're getting it quickly and and as soon as you can do that, great. But in the beginning, if we have horses that are high headed and have been hollow, this sort of thing, we want them to contact the bit like with the side reins. We want them at such a length that w the horse just can't throw its head all the way up. Like if it gets up to here, it's going to feel the contact and then go back down. So we're not trying to tie it down. 
But if we put it up on top, then the horse can literally go straight up in the air. There's nothing, uh -huh. you know, it doesn't encounter any contact. So with young horses, generally, you want them on the side. You want them long enough that if the horse goes all the way up, it's going to feel contact with the bit on some level before it can get its head all the way up, you know, and start doing this kind of nonsense. So just a little bit. So that's basically it. All right, cool. Then I have, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, but Sue Gardner from England, I think you no. said you were. She's asking, like, so should I uh, work my young horse in hand for one or one and a half years before I start to ride them? Well, that's not really necessary because as soon as they start to understand the stretching in hand, you can start adding the lunging. And then when they understand to, to be lunged in the stretch, in the walk and in the trot, that would already be the phase for me that I'm going to start backing them. I'm going to add the saddle. If they can stay relaxed under the saddle and the walk and the trot, I'm going to start get on. If they if they cannot stretch there, so so no, I wouldn't I wouldn't work my horse just in hand for one and one and a half years before I start riding them. Absolutely not. It's way too long. No, no. and once again, it depends on the horse. Now, having said that, if you were starting with some horse's back looks like this, I mean, yes. I would not get on a horse's back till its back is can come up and support the weight of the rider. So that could be very different depending on the horse, the age of it, you know, how long it takes. And, uh, you know, once again, if the horse is, uh, well, however long it takes, let's put it that way. Yeah, sure. I don't get on a horse till it can lift its back and that's it, you know. So when they can do that, then you can start getting on. And the point is, if you, you know, once you learn to feel the difference between a horse back is up, and when it's up, it feels quite different once you get used to it, because you're, you're like lifted up through your seat bones. You feel like you're lifted up on something. Very different than sitting in a horse that's hollow. You feel like you're being, we've all been on a horse like that. It just feels like it's dragging us around the arena. You know, you, you, just, you don't feel like you're connected to it because you're kind of in a hole that's just kind of being drug along by the front legs, you know? So learning to recognize that thing of whether the horse is over the back or not, once again, first visually, and then learning to feel that, the feel, what does it feel like when you're up there? Because if you've never felt it, most people today have never been on a horse working over its back. Most horses today are going either hollow or they're going over their backs in tents. Neither of those are the correct feel. The horse must be relaxed to give you the correct feel of lifting its back and to feel supple. Yes, a horse can feel lifted in its back, but horses that are tense with their backs up feel more like a horse that's going to poop rather than a horse that's because a horse because they're lifting its <laughs> back in, you know, because they don't because they're tense. They don't a horse that's correct is lifting up through the withers. So you feel lifted here and it tends to bring your chest. It, you make makes you want to, you know, push you up straight. So your position also, that's the thing to realize is that your position on a hollow horse is never going to be good because there's no energy pushing you up into the correct position that helps us to feel like we like we need to stretch up to stay in balance. You know, in a hollow horse, you can lean over and hump your shoulders and all these kind of things because you're not nothing is really pushing you. You're not you're not you're not experienced the wave. You know, when the horse's back is up, it feels just like a wave in the ocean picking you up and just carrying you forward. There's nothing, you don't feel like you have to leg, 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 and this kind of thing like we see people doing at horse shows these days all the time, you know, with bloody spurs and this kind of thing. Because most of the time, people today are forcing the horses against the hand. And once again, that's getting back to the work in hand, why that's important. You got you can't work a horse in hand and hang on to its mouth. The horse simply will stop and it won't go anywhere. So, you know, so important for your development. All right, next question. Well, yeah, and I was going to say, like, as a small, small addition, because I know with Puda, with my oldest, I, I've been beside her for four years. So, no, obviously not with every horse. I know that. I was just thinking in the line of training a young horse, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a year or a year and a half to be next to it. Um, okay. Usually. Um, so, I have another question that is, any insights on rehabbing older horses? Because I'm 69 and I will probably always ride older ones. I've rehabbed two successfully so far by letting them make all the decision as to when it comes to coming up, etc. My guys are 19 and 32, are going strong, and a 32-year-old was broken in the neck and had been retired because he tried to kill his professional trainer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so do you have any extra insights on, on rehabbing older horses? Well, no, it sounds like, once again, there is no difference. I mean, the system that I use is exactly the same, whether they're 30 years old or they're three years old. I'm going to go through the exact same steps. It all is just a matter of how the time. Some young horse with a really strong back may go through these first steps. I've had horses that, you know, in two weeks, you know, look like you could go in, you know, in a first level dressage test. I've had other ones that's taken two years. So, you know, there is no, you know, 
there's kind of a generality about time. In other words, if you're doing it correctly from the time you start, a horse should have a pretty well-developed top line in about one to two years, somewhere in that, in that ballpark. Um, it's never going to be faster than that. No horse is ever going to develop a, you know, a great top line that's correctly developed, once again, and not tense. You know? And once again, very often when you see tense horses, they'll, they may look like they're developed, but if you look across the lower back, they usually have what we call a bread roll because they've been held in tension. So there's this weird, like, instead of being concave, it's the other way around. It's kind of the lower back is now overly rounded like this, almost like a bread roll across the back. So that's from horses being tense in the back try that's why i'm saying it feels like horses that are tense feel like more like a horse that's pooping than a horse that's lifting its back because they're lifting in the wrong place only the back comes up and that's tense but the withers is what we want to come up there and that's what lifts you up and once again lets you sit straight and lets you equitate on the back of the horse there's nothing more ridiculous or harder than trying to equitate you know in other words make yourself look and hold a position on a horse that's hollow because you can't I mean, watch anybody riding saddle bridge. They're all permanently behind the behind the either legs or not in front of them. I mean, on the and all that's because they're riding horses hollow. It would be very hard to get your leg under you on a horse that's as hollow as a saddle bread or Tennessee Walker. You know? Clear. But, then I have one question left from Lisa, and that is: When working in hand, what is the difference between tapping a horse with a whip in order to ask him? to stretch and tapping the horse with a whip in order to ask him to do a side press or a shoulder in. And I think that there, the whole thing with the whip is, is that you want to activate the hind end. So you use the whip to ask the horse to start moving the hind leg so he starts to get activated. And as soon as the horse is active and willing to move, you can start catch him in the hand. As, as long as your horse is not willing to go anywhere, yeah, you can you can do with your hand whatever it is you want. So it's never really asking, or it's not never really tapping a horse with a whip in order to ask him to stretch. It's asking them to activate the hind quarters and asking for a side pass or a shoulder in is really asking that inside hind leg to come underneath the horse. And from there, the horse, because the back is being activated, will drop his head automatically. So it's more a result of the back being activated than what you ask with the whip to do. Am I, am I correct? No, here? exactly. That's the point is that when the whip, when the stretch is correct, it, it, it is initiated from the back end of the horse. Once again, that's why we do shoulder and lateral work is to get the horse to step onto the body one side at a time and push the back up on that inside hind leg. That's how we get it to happen at first. Cause it's very difficult to get it to go in a straight line. The horse isn't there yet. Once the horse has lifted its back, then we start thinking about going in a straight line and doing certain things that help these things. But in the beginning, we've got to do that lateral work because we've got to get one side working at a time and get the back begin to lift as it comes into position. And then we can start to think about bend from side to side. Once again, no horse can ever bend until its back lifts it. So, so to think about it, to even talk about it in any other way, how many times do you hear, you know, I hear trainers telling, oh, ride him deep into that corner, force him to bend through that corner, make him bend, you know, pull his, make his head go straight into that corner. <laughs> that doesn't do anything except make the horse do a horrible turn. It will never bend the <laughs> horse. Trying to force a horse into a corner, trying to force anything will never ask a horse to bend. It's only when a horse can lift its back, then they bend very easily. In other words, so longitudinal bend, that is the lift upwards, must happen before lateral bend can happen. So once you understand that, you don't frustrate yourself wondering, well, why doesn't my horse bend? Well, it doesn't bend because it can't lift its back. As soon as it can, it will. Simple as that. Yeah. All right. Two more questions. Then we're going to end this question, this session, because else we're going to be here all day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we have a topic given two weeks from now. So then we have yeah, exactly. two more questions. We'll do it again. Yeah, exactly. So one question is, is it always the rule that any dip behind the saddle, no matter how small, is a sign of non-engagement through the whole back. Well, I think that that also comes with the, with the build and the confirmation of the horse to begin with, but well, they're, they're just horses that have been having so many drop backs due to, well, uh, and the past that they've been having. It's, it's really hard to say that if there's a, a bit of a dip, then the horse is not engaged. I think you should look in the total picture of the horse being working into the contact. If there's diagonal mm -hmm. pairs and 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 where the weight of the horse is at, if you look at it. But maybe you have a little bit more to add to that. Yeah. So the point is, it's to degree. So if you take a horse that 
you know, is really dipped in the back and whatever, and we get them to stretch and start working through the back. Well, we can get them to work through the back, but the dip is still there. So it's going to take, you know, months, you know, one to two years for that dip to completely go away. But our goal, but it will go away completely if you do the work correctly. So it, so in other words, it's still a sign if you're seeing it, that there's a weakness there that can still be developed beyond what you see, because it will go away. Yeah, yeah exactly. So the last question is from Denisa, and her question is, what is the reason that you prefer to use side reins? Um, because she's always used elastics because she's learned that the horse have less restraint. If they go up with their heads, they get uncomfortable instead of going into a wall with the side reins and they learn to release and go down in a soft way. Um, well, in my experience, I would say that once again, if the horse is ready to come up, to the degree that it can come up, it will come up and regular side reins are fine. What I have found the problem with elastic side reins is ten people, they don't, they give too much and the horses can, but always remembering is we're not trying to, if you're bringing them up so shortly that they're really fighting that, then it's elastic or otherwise you brought them up too high. It just shouldn't be that difficult. And, and as I said, and the problem with elastic ones, they tend to want to kind of play with them because there's kind of too much play. Of course, they can be different depending on how elastic they are. But, you know, I find the donut ones, I prefer the, the kind that have the round rubber donut. They have a little bit of give, but they don't just, you know, they're not so elastic that the horse can just like play with it and stretch it out. Because, you know, you want to you have enough contact that it disciplines the horse from doing that. We don't want the horse to suddenly start yawing on the horse. Now that doesn't say, I mean, I've certainly trained some because that's all the people had with elastic side reins and I've used them, you know, um, with the same and using the same kind of um, criteria that I use for anything else. And it wasn't a big problem. So I'm saying if you're doing it correctly, it's not a big problem unless they're too stretchy, you know, and you kind of feel them. I mean, I've felt ones that you could barely pull apart. Well, that's what you want. Same thing with those rubber ones. You can pull them apart with the rubber donuts. They pull a little bit, but they don't just go, you know, you can't just, you know, stretch them like an elastic band. So I think that would be my, my answer there. So. All right. Cool. Well, those were the questions. Well, there's one, one more, like, uh, where can we find the recording? Well, I'm going to put them up on YouTube. I'm going to share the video. I'm going to edit it and put it all together and then share it with Will so he can put it onto the YouTube of Art to Ride itself as well. Great. And we will share it into the Facebook group. So, so you guys can always find it back um for now will i want to thank you so much for your time this evening well for me the evening for you the morning <laughs> i hope you enjoyed your coffee and i'm going back to dinner now um we will see each other again in two weeks and then we're going to discuss when you know how to uh, how and when to bring your horse into the working position because quite a few people have already been stretching for quite some time and now sort of struggling with bringing the horses back into the or actually up into the working frame that's me included so i'm i'm really uh, curious I'm, I'm going to put up a video to to uh share with you so you can give some some insights on that part um okay. For now, I'm going to wish you a very good day. And for everyone that's back in uh, the U.S., I wish you all a good day. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other in uh, two, weeks, two weeks. All right. Thank you, everybody. Once again, thanks to Sabina for putting all this together. It's been wonderful. I hope everybody has enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you for another one in a couple of weeks. Keep your uh, questions coming in. And we'll keep to try to keep everybody as informed as we can. So thank you all very much. And I'll see you all soon. See you in two weeks. Bye. Bye.